evening. Uh, as you may know, April is National Poetry Month, and tonight we're celebrating verse and stanza with the annual Insight Poetry Bash. My name is Leah Tottenham. I'm from the Vancouver Public Library's Programming and Learning Team. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that my home and the Vancouver Public Library are located on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. This evening's event is part of Insight, Captivating Explorations of Books and Ideas, and this is a series presented in partnership between the Vancouver Writers Fest and the Vancouver Public Library. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about an upcoming library event uh, on Thursday evening, May 6th. I'd like to invite you to join us online for Pong Pong, a fascinating exploration of the contemporary history of Mahjong. June Chow from the Youth Collaborative for Chinatown in Vancouver, Jessica Lam from Tea Parlor in Calgary, and Florence Yi from Tea Base in Toronto will be sharing knowledge, stories, and family traditions surrounding the beloved game of Chinese tiles. More information about this and other events can be found at vpl.ca slash events or by signing up for our email newsletter. And now please join me in a warm welcome as I pass things over to Leslie Hertig, Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers Fest. Thanks very much, Leah, and hello, Leslie. everyone. Good evening and welcome to our Insight Poetry Bash. Tonight, we have a stellar collection of new poetry to share with you. Tennille Campbell, Mary Germain, Dallas Hunt, Jen Sukfeng Lee, Rebecca Salazar, and Terence Young join us on our virtual stage this evening with the wonderful author and host Dina Dalbukia at the helm. A big thanks goes out once again to our Insight partner, the Vancouver Public Library, for their collaboration and support. Thanks also to our government sponsors, the Government of Canada, the Government of BC, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. This is our eighth Insight event of the season, and just a reminder that we host events every other Wednesday until the end of May, as well as some special events throughout the season. Tickets are now on sale for our Spring Book Club, featuring one of America's most highly regarded contemporary authors, Viet Tan Nguyen, in conversation with Scotia Giller Prize winner Ian Williams. We're pleased to be welcoming them on Sunday, May 16th. And in addition, we just announced a new event featuring superstar OBGYN Dr. Jen Gunter with her new book, The Menopause Manifesto. That event will happen on June 16th, and tickets include a copy of the new book. And mark your calendars now because our flagship festival, festival will return in the third week of October. Soon I'm going to turn things over to our host this evening and Dina will invite our poets to share some of their new works and then there'll be some time for audience questions which you can submit using the YouTube chat function. Dina Del Bucchia is a writer, podcaster, literary event host, and creative writing instructor. She's the author of the short story collection, Don't Tell Me What to Do, and four collections of poetry, Coping with Emotions and Otters, Blind Items, Rom-Com, written with Daniel Zamparelli, and It's a Big Deal. She's the artistic director of the Real Vancouver Writers Series and hosts the podcast, Can't Lit, with Jen Suk Fung Lee. Please welcome Dina. Hello, and welcome to the Insight Poetry Bash. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, when Leslie asked if I wanted to host tonight's event, I saw the list of poets and I absolutely screamed with delight, which I won't do now, I will spare you all. Um, but I was so excited. Uh, there were debut collections here that are going to blow your mind. There are uh, seasoned poets that have been honing their craft, just incredible. So I could not be more thrilled uh, to be here. Um, and I don't wanna take up a ton of your time because you're here for the poets. You're not here for this guy. Um, I wore a dress with birds on it because it felt like very not National Poetry Month vibes. Uh, very put a bird on it. It was between this and a Tweety Bird button up. And you know what? I went with this, kind of regret it now. So let's get to business. Um, oh, and the other thing, I just want to reiterate what Leslie said. Uh, please, if you have a question, you can 
add it to the YouTube chat. Um, a lot of times we ask people to submit their questions at the end, but as you're hearing these poets, you may develop a question right in that moment. So uh, take that opportunity and write it down and we'll go through the questions at the end of the event and hopefully we can answer a few of those or that the poets can. So uh, I've read all of these new books by these poets. I have them all right here in a beautiful stack and uh, you can do this too if you order these books from your local bookstore or get them from the library. Um, and they're all amazing books. None of these books will disappoint you and they will fuel you, they will set you ablaze, they will have you marveling at the skill, talent, and beauty of these poems. So let's get started. Uh, first up, we're gonna have Rebecca Salazar who wrote Sulphur Tongue. Uh, Sulphur Tongue burned through me. These poems are powerful skilled and taught as Kinesia Lubrin describes the book and the blurb here. The singular power of this work rests not only in its wholly mature command of the craft, but in how Salazar's sulfur tongue is a burning votive towards a world where the warped silos of history's personal, ecologic and collective toil gather toward a new imagining. Rebecca Salazar is a writer, editor, and community organizer living on the unceded territory of the Wulatsutuik people. The author of poetry chapbooks, The Knife You Need to Just That Justifies the Wound from Rahila's Ghost Press and Guzzle from Anne Struther Press. Her first full-length collection, Sulphur Tongue, is out now with McClellan and Stewart Poetry. Please welcome Rebecca. Hi, and thank you so much, Dina, for introducing me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I am, as Dina mentioned, in unceded Wollastook territory right now, where it is currently 11.07 p.m., and I am definitely wearing pajamas below the Zoom screen. Uh, I'm going to start with a poem about a drag show I went to in Halifax a few years ago. Uh, so content warning that this poem does deal with gendered and sexual abuse um, and also has a lot of uh, bad jokes. Outings. The night I heard Trixie Mattel tell a rape joke, my rapist was outed on Twitter. And how do you follow that act? Trixie says, I miss the days when drag queens could be mean. Like if you left a show early, a queen could just heckle you. Something like, I hope you get raped. And the whole room erupts. Read me, closeted, thrift store, leather, femme, millennial, triggered and checking Twitter, sober slumped outside a high school theater, trying not to cry in front of baby gaze. Read me, stacking more triggers than Trixie stacks wigs when someone tweets my rapist name into the noise. Like what about what? did. Who are you, O oh, subtweet oracle, to spill my filth? Read me, still salty about Trixie as my friend sneaks selfies at the highlight photo booth with her so close behind the velvet ropes, they tell me they can smell her. Haze of hairspray, glycol mist, and cotton candy. Sweet as days when drag shows weren't full of women. Days when gay, survivor, gay survivors kept the dress code, tits out, trauma tucked, strike up the feminine, punch down, the show must glow on. I was indecisive tonight about what to read and I actually asked my friends to vote on Instagram. So thank you everyone who selected poems for me. Uh, the Libra energy was strong today. <laughs> uh, my next poem is from I think the third section of Sulphur Tongue, it was previously included in my first chapbook, Guzzle. So thanks to Katie fuster Yan for editing that one. Um, I got to work with uh, the amazing Dion Brand for the full length collection. And I have been seriously blessed with some incredible editors. Um, so thank your editors out there. <laughs> uh, this poem is actually one of the less uh, I'm gonna say offensive and m most family friendly poems, but it's called kink. So take what you will from that. Um, here it goes, kink. 
wanting you is like waiting for lightning to strike me each time is each time I smell rain. The heat stings your skin in sharp swifts, a spiked roller of dressmaker's pins. Come fix me with your pearl eyes in the wildflowers by the road. Traces of shell, manure, earth, break the flesh and prepare for a harvest of salt. The hack geometry of granite bluffs hatched across your back. We press you close until it cuts. I'll finish tonight uh, with a poem that contains a few quotations. Uh, there's a line here from Leslie Jameson's The Empathy Exams, which is a fantastic essay collection. And it is immediately followed in the poem by uh, something I wrote down after my cousin's four-year-old uh, at the time said it. And it was just one of those really creepy things that kids say that is almost a poem in itself. This is Body Heat. The glitter outline of your torso on the bed confesses that we cannot guess what marks we make. Skin like the surface of the sun, any touch encroaching on your orbit burns to ash, neglects to scar. My food addiction when your pregnancy ends stopped. I gained your baby weight. I didn't know if this was empathy or theft. Mommy, look, I'm drawing you, Mommy. It looks just like you look, and you have no face. Since the fire boiled the fat from my bones, I'm a billowing tarp at half-mast on the scaffolding. Watch me swell in the updraft. Thanks, and thank you to all the poets and to Dina, and thank you for Writers Fest for hosting us. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And I just want to say that my Libra rising appreciates you. And um, as promised, those poems were incredible. Thank you so much. Uh, I just was told in the chat that I have no face. So I hope that my face returns. And if it doesn't, that's okay. Oh, you were quoting. <laughs> Kids are funny. That's why you have to sometimes write down what they say. So next just skipping on along. We're moving on to smithereens. Um, and smithereens is blessed with blurbs by so many like big name poetry heavy hitters. Um, I don't have any other sports metaphors on hand, but that one, uh, my patented sports metaphors are coming in handy. But I like uh, Eve Joseph's best Kaleidoscopic in nature, these poems transform the ordinary into the extraordinary. Terence Young lives on Vancouver Island in the traditional territories of the Lekongwen and Songhees people. He's a founder and former editor of the Claremont Review, a literary magazine for young writers. Smithereens is his third collection of poetry. And at the last event I did with Terence, uh, we found out that he published Jen Sukfong Lee's early poems when she was a teen. So that's your fun fact. Please welcome Terrence. Thank you very much, Dina. Am I here yet? Hello? Anybody seeing me there? Yes, I can see you and it looks great. Oh, it's good. Okay, because I yeah. can't, I don't have um I don't have an image. It's not oh. coming, but that's fine. I can I can extemporize here. Um yeah, thank you, Dina, for the introduction. And uh, yes, I did publish Jen. Um I I cannot remember how many years ago that was, and it's probably not wise to think about numbers anyway. Um I want to thank the Vancouver Writers Fest. And the, and the Vancouver Public Library for inviting me here uh, to read it in sight. It's, uh, uh, I've long heard uh, about the event and uh, it's really uh, quite an honor to be invited. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I will um, start off with a bit of show and tell um, just because that's always fun. Uh, who doesn't like show and tell or bring and brag as we call it in the education business. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen one of these. Probably not. 
Um, it might have been made long before you were born. It's um, a candle, uh, and a friend of mine uh, manufactured these uh, in the mid to late 70s and sold them by the thousands through uh, Hudson's Bay, various craft fairs and things like that. They it has a light in it and it lights up this scene and it's a, a very sort of warm and cozy kind of thing. He was quite entrepreneurial. And um, I had forgotten about them, I think for the most part until I came across one uh, in, a, in a secondhand store and uh, it, uh, it brought me back to him. And so this, uh, this poem is uh, for Ken, uh, it's called uh, Fern Island Candle, which is a registered trademark. Match to wick, then flame, a resurrection, courtesy, value village. For only eight dollars, my friend lives again in this paraffin shrine, fashioned from sand, and driftwood and wax and maidenhair fern, which I picked up and put down, then purchased only because he had made it 40 years earlier or not. Busy man that he was supplying craft fairs, boutiques, the Hudson's Bay, a businessman with hired help who combed beaches for him, the forests, set the molds, trimmed waste. So for all I know, he may never even have seen this refugee from the landfill. In our bathroom, it casts a familiar antique yellow, its trademark glow comfortable as the 70s soft rock of its time, the marketable light we had almost forgotten, as we had almost forgotten him, his drowning. It took four decades for someone to say enough is enough to relegate their dated kitsch to the thrift store shelf, to sit among beer mugs, Tupperware, toaster ovens and fondue pots where this relic will return when I am done with it, done with nostalgia, the search for time lost, friends who have disappeared, happy for now to let it burn and brighten, brighten and burn, to revive those days when the metaphor of a candle, what it means to snuff out, to be snuffed out, was still just a metaphor. And um, this final poem that I'll read is uh, probably um, self-explanatory. It's called The Party. And I think we all have an image in our mind of what that means in various forms. Um, and uh, I, it actually was published in a journal in Berlin, uh, which I, my head I think of as probably a serious party city. So here we go. This is called The Party. They were told the party was on. They were told everyone would be at the party. They should come. They should really come but they were of two minds. It's a party, they said in one mind. It's a party, they said in the other mind. Both statements were equally true. It was a question of timing. It was a question of distance, but it was neither of those things. Do we go to parties, they asked themselves. Do we like parties? They asked themselves. Now they were getting somewhere. They had been to parties. There were pictures. Parties are like Christmas, she said. I know exactly what you mean, he said. 
She went on to tell him why parties were like Christmas. And he listened politely, saying only, I know, I know, and thinking parties are like sand. Parties are like water on level ground. Parties are like the wind beneath a door. When she was finished, she asked, aren't we done with parties? What do you mean by done? He asked. You know what I mean, she said. True, he did. But he didn't like the idea of being done with anything. What's the point, she asked. Does there have to be a point, he asked. I knew you were going to say that, she said. It's a celebration, he said. All parties are a celebration, she said. I knew you were going to say that, he said. The celebration isn't important, she said. It's the excuse. The excuse for what, he asked. Parties are for getting laid, she said. Getting laid is like sand, he said. Getting laid is like water on level ground, she said. Getting laid is like the wind beneath a door, he said. Getting laid is like Christmas, they agreed. In the end, they chose not to think about the party. In the end, he came upon her washing her hair. In the end, she interrupted him shaving. In the end, they had a good time. In the end, they left early. In the end, they drifted home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terrence. And now, time to bring in our next reader. Jen's ready, I know. Um, so the shadow list, while I was reading it, it made me say all kinds of swear words to myself and sometimes out loud. And I mean that in a very good way. Um, as Otania Julianne Akopatek says in her blurb of the shadow list, the shadow list is poetry to wish the old hurts away and conjure the present for us who live and love between rays of light. So I'm very excited to read this bio of uh, my co-host and dear friend. Jen Sukfong Lee was born and raised in Vancouver's East Side, and she now lives with her son in North Burnaby. Her books include The Conjoined, nominated for International Dublin Literary Award and a finalist for the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize, The Better Mother, a finalist for the City of Vancouver Book Award, The End of East, Gentlemen of the Shade, and Chinese New Year. Jen teaches at the Writer's Studio Online with Simon Fraser University, edits fiction for Woolsack and Wynn, and co-hosts the literary podcast, Can't Let, with me. She's with me forever, Jen Sukbong Lee. Hi, thanks, Dina. Um, Dina and I are forever yoked. Um, it's not a bad thing, honestly. If I'm gonna be forever yoked to anybody, I, I'm very glad it's Dina. Um, thank you. Uh, everybody for being here and thank you to Leslie and the Vancouver Writers Fest for um, doing this with us. Um, I just realized while I'm looking at myself right now with like my gold chain and my like animal print sweater, I'm like dressed like a 90s hip hop Asian tiger mom, which seems like a fine vibe. I think I can roll with it. Um, that might be my the title of my next book. <laughs> Why not? Um, so I'm going to read to you from The Shadow List, which is my first poetry collection. I'm very excited. I actually didn't write poetry for about 15 years. Um, and I am just really happy to have these poems out there. So this is really special to me. So the first uh, poem I'm going to read is called uh, Five Breakups with the Same Man. One, you sent him a very long text, the kind you have to tap twice to read. He didn't respond. It was Christmas. Two. During sex, he said he loved you, you pretended not to hear him, went home, and he didn't call for six months. Three, he met you at a bar, you had to call him the next day, standing in the lobby of your friend's apartment building in a coat that still carried his cologne and say you couldn't see him again, but you did three weeks later. Four, 
He called. He said he could be a stepfather to your son, and your tears were vicious and hot, but still, you said no, and he said he would walk away. Five, in an email, he asked for a poem you had written about him. You sent it. He didn't write back. What did you expect? Um, so this one is called Yesterday You Had the Best of Intentions. A glass of water, tepid and undrunk in the bedroom air. A body beside you whose movements are so small and so slow you cannot measure them. Muddy, thick hours spent listening to the night pass. This is the long rolling of time, that liquid dim that breaks over the neighbor's rooftops and leaks through a crack in those curtains you have never hemmed. The broken lamp beside the garage buzzing, a raccoon walking upside down, claws tapping and tapping on the gutter it clings to. You squint the continued watch in the night. The black hurts your eyes. Do you know what you're watching for? There are secrets, indecent and jagged, like a stranger's teeth biting the thin line of your clavicle. You could whisper them now and he would not hear you. But no, you should wait. Nighttime lulls that soft, enabling dark. Outside, the first chickadee sings. You have 20 minutes, maybe 30, before the sky lifts, burning, and kills what you have been staring at all night long. Um, so a portion of this novel I wrote, or novel, see? I, I, I have novelist brain. A uh, portion of this uh, book are um, poems that I wrote for other uh, creatures. I say creatures because I also wrote a poem for my um, previous dog. Um, and one of these poems I wrote for my friend Carrie, um, who is an author. And um, there was uh, a few years ago, she was diagnosed with a really aggressive form of leukemia. And she was actually my first writing group. It was two of us when we were 18. and. Um, it was really quite a time. She's fine now uh, and in remission, but um, yeah, I wrote this poem for her. This is how you answer her for Carrie. What you didn't know, platelets separated from the blood are not red or clear, but a deep yellow, thick in the intravenous bag, like tangible sunshine, you say, trying to sound positive, but really they terrify you. Their color like death made liquid, dripping slowly into the hole the surgeon has drilled into her chest, her beautiful chest with a pair of doves tattooed in mid-flight. What you have always known, the edge of her gaze when she asked you the hard questions. Do you believe in love anymore? Why haven't you fucked him yet? When will you write the poems again? Like a scythe to the overgrowth in your head and then you were quiet until she bought you another coffee so you would talk and she said, the world needs your poems and you laughed but you believed it too. What you wish for. Her early morning texts from gas stations in Montana or Wyoming, where her kids are smeared with mud, their eyes bright because momentum is what they live for, because speeding through unfamiliar landscapes is how she has taught them to calm a restless mind, because the long unpredictable road, not the hospital hallway she is now pacing in mad laps, is the right place for her to be. Um, this last poem I wrote uh, that I'm going to read to you is called Poll, P-O-L-L, -L, you know, like a Twitter poll. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, here we go. Poll. Is it okay to want things, stand in a window and wait for a man to shatter it with a rock, take a stress nap every afternoon, eat, buy fancy underwear and put them in the dryer, not know the answer, listen in the night for heavy feet on your stairs? That's it. Thank you so much. It looks so, oh, there we go. Hi, sorry about that. I don't know what that was. Um, 
Thanks for your patience. All right, we're back. I, hey, Leslie. Um, Are you okay? Back? You're back on. So. Yeah. Okay. I think we're good. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Technical difficulties. What a delight. Just kidding. I hate them. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happened. But what's important is that now we are going to get to hear from Dallas Hunt reading from Creeland. Um, the very deliberate way these poems are on the page, the, the beauty in that um, really made me reconsider and think about um, language. And to turn to these incredible blurbs, I complain about blurbs, even though I love giving them, but asking for them is absolutely a nightmare. Um, but there are great blurbs for Creeland. Uh, Billy Ray Belcourt describes Creeland as tender and aching and intellectually exciting, and I could not agree more. Dallas Hunt is Cree and a member of the Wapasusipi Swan River First Nation in Treaty 8 Territory in Northern Alberta. He has had creative work published in Contemporary Verse 2, Prairie Fire, Prison International, and Arc Poetry. His first children's book, Hawassus and the World Famous Bannock, was published through Highwater Press in 2018 and was nominated for several awards. His new book, Cree Land, is out now with Nightwood Editions. Hunt is an assistant professor of Indigenous Literatures at the University of British Columbia. Please welcome Dallas. Okay, Tansi Nita Temdek, Dallas Hunt Nitsagasan, Nia Omanehio, Egwa Wapsusipi Otsunia. So, as Dina was uh, just saying, um, yeah, I'm from Swan River First Nation in Treaty Territory in Northern Alberta. Uh, the book is called Treeland. So, uh, I don't have a copy of it, I have an online copy of it. So, that's probably, uh, well, that's what I'm going to read from. Um, and uh, I just want to thank Leslie, the Vancouver Public Library, uh, Dina, who I've seen. Uh, several times in the last two weeks, I feel like, and uh, everyone else, Tineo uh, Jen, every, everybody reading right now is, uh, is just uh, incredible. So uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm just gonna read a few quick poems. Um, and uh, yeah, that should be uh, it. Um, yeah, I'm also um, just want to give a shout out to, uh, not a shout out, but I want to acknowledge that um, I usually come from the territories of the uh, the the Swelitooth, um, Musqueam, and Squamish peoples in Vancouver, and so I just wanted to um, really appreciate them for uh, all of the well, yeah, all of the things that they endure in many ways. So okay, here we go. This one is called Cree Dictionary. Um, so Cree Dictionary, the translation for joy in Cree is a fried bologna sandwich. The translation for bittersweet in Cree looks like a cows and plows payment, eight decades too late. The translation for patience in Cree is an auntie looking after four of her own children and two of her sisters. The translation for evil in Cree is the act of uh, not calling your mother on a Sunday. The translation for expedition in Cree is traveling 20 minutes to the only gas station in Faust, Alberta to buy a high guard pizza sub. The translation for success in Cree is executing the perfect frog splash on your younger brother. The Cree word for white men is unpaid child support. The translation for conflicted in Cree is your deep, steadfast love for a uh, country's superstar Dwight Yoakam, or depending on the regional dialect, George Jones, Patsy Klein, or Blue Rodeo. The Cree word for constellation is a Saskatoon berry bush in summertime. The translation for policeman in Cree is Mitzi Nitsukat Kokos. The translation for genius in Cree is your cook muttering in her sleep. The Cree word for poetry is your four-year-old niece's cracked lips spilling out broken syllables in the heyawin between the gaps in her teeth. Um, and let's do this one. So the next one is wake. Wake. 
Doubt is an ocean, a vast capacious body your unwashed ancestors traversed. The ocean mediates seemingly ceaseless plateau, ships in their shameful bellies, underbellies and undercurrents, idiots at the helm. Once more onto the breach, your great grandfather said like a fucking idiot who would later go on to cannibalize a village settlement violently arranged a schema did your ancestors bellow quote we the north unironically the bush rending their flesh from bone stripping bark to weave a basket let's picnic with this bounty full of plump hearts the fruit from your family tree your ancestors had wooden teeth read a mouthful of splinters is that a metaphor of colonialism uh, probably or maybe your ancestors should have brushed their fucking teeth there are miles at stake there are miles at stake, a breaststroke across the Atlantic with nothing but miles at stake. Uh, this one is called, I only tried to break. So let's see if I can find that quickly. And I did, great. I only tried to break. No to we is a knock at the door best left unanswered. His ancestors a bruising cacophony, fists pelting hardwood, brutal messiahs demanding entry, their history is a battering ram, a cleaving through fragile door frames. He clamors, I only tried to break the door down to make a stone out of you. Chert, most likely, a set of stress, thrust vaulting, a focal point of pressurized slamming, deadbolts crumbling. No to we is a wrap. Sure at the door, a grim reaper and feel a track pants. I yell from the other side. I only want to be the air that slips between the gaps in your fingers, those eager hands quietly forming heavy fists. My peephole, a glimpse into weathering debris, the debris he'll make out of me. Deposition, the ebb and flow of small particles until sedimentation occurs and I'm at the bottom of an estuary, water passing over, gliding and soothing, carrying wounds to still lakes and crummy ponds. Um, this one is called Entry 4. My couch is a bed of pencils. Uh, is there such a thing as writing back to legibility or rallying against consumption in Indigenous literary studies? Every time I write Cookham, some settler somewhere comes. And when I say tug eye, the same settler smiles to themselves, having mastered the vernacular, hung around the edges just enough to be in the know titillated and satiated. The vibrancy of Indian life on display is endlessly knowable, learnable. It's unimaginable that there's more going on beneath the surface, that there are whole economies of care and relation that are imperceptible, nonsensical, and because of this, illegible. I'll tell you a story. My cookum, please control yourself, and Nikui worked at a downtown restaurant in Edmonton named the Cecil. It was near the rat hole, a since demolished car tunnel. Now both no longer exist. While Nikui waited on customers and cockroaches skittered uh, across basement walls, I'd sit patiently awaiting a breakfast my cookum somehow found the time to prepare for me as the kitchen was slammed with orders. She'd hand the meal she prepared over to me or over to my mother to deliver to my chubby grubby hands or would scuttle out of the kitchen herself, arthritis endeavoring but ultimately failing to slow her down. I know that acts of care and love are supposed to be noisy declarations to draw attention to both the recipient and giver of love, but I also know we didn't have a lot of food at home, so my grandmother would hide pieces of bacon under the pancakes she had made for me, so if the manager walked by, she or my mother wouldn't get in trouble and my belly would be that much fuller that day. I think about these intimate acts of care of getting on in the world obsessively. I don't care how much you know about Indians or which stories or words you decide to take and which to leave because I remember how full my belly felt from that borrowed bacon and yes, how full I felt from my cookum's rickety love. And I think I have time for one more. So, oh uh, yeah, this one be quick. This one's for my mom. Um, so, He's not definitely not watching the stream, but shout out, mom. Love you. Okay, here we go. This one's called Cook and Freedom, and it's for Nico E. Freedom is selecting the premium cable bundle, even though you can't afford it, and even though all you watch are the film channels and TLC, falling asleep to John Hughes' movie marathons and reruns of 90 Day Fiance. Freedom is when the low fuel light shines bright on your dashboard, but you drive to work anyway lifting your foot off the gas pedal as you careen downhill, momentum carrying you forward. Freedom is a phone bill that will never be paid, but you call your niece anyway to see if she'll come over to visit, gossip, and mop your floors for $20. Freedom is a bingo dabber that never runs out because when it does, you remove the top and you pour coffee in to mix with the ink. Freedom is a debt 
you can't escape that you charge another Slurpee to your overdraft debit card because it's sizzling outside and blue raspberry is your favorite flavor and they have it this time of year and fuck them anyway. Um, hi, hi. Thanks everybody for listening to me read poetry. I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dallas. And I have seen Dallas read several times and I've had the, the pleasure of introducing him. And you know what? Never get tired of it. So it's a treat every time. Um, yeah, incredible poems. We have already had four incredible poets, but we are not done yet. Not by a long shot, folks. So let's keep going. Um, again, I just want to remind you, if you do have any questions, please add them into the YouTube chat. Um, I'm sure these writers would love to uh, answer your, your very best questions. You know what? Your comments are there. So that's the beauty of this. No comments, questions only coming through in the end. Um, so let's get a move on. Um, I do not have a physical copy, unfortunately, of this next book. Um, but the poems in uh, Congratulations, Rhododendrons um, are so clever and some truly made me L. Uh, even the, the titles created very funny. They were very funny. Um, and as Rob McLennan wrote uh, on his blog, Rob McLennan's blog, I think it is safe to say that Jermaine is writing some of the finest poem titles I've seen in some time. They are remarkable for their evocative wit and slightly twisted humor. And I would say that is something that runs through the whole collection. Mary Jermaine is a poet and educator and PhD student at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton. Her poems have appeared in the Walrus Magazine, Riddle Fence, The Art Sci Effect, and Augur Magazine. She was the recipient of the Adam Penn Gilder Scholarship for Creative Writing from the University of Toronto and the Heeshap Award he slipped award from the from Memorial University. Her special talents include finding lost items and having a face that reminds people of someone else they know. I gotta be honest, I often get that same response. So let's take a look at your face. Please welcome Mary. Hello, okay, Ooh, I feel nervous. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Dina, for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the Vancouver Writers' Festival and the VPL for having me. I'm actually in Newfoundland right now and um, I am virtually enjoying your balmy spring weather. Um, I'm gonna read uh, three poems and the first one has an incredibly long title. I was already planning to read it, so I'm glad that the title stuff came up. Lines from inside a cage of bees, which are not in fact bees because all the bees are dead forever and who let that happen, hey? This is the night the Lord has made, the wind and sour snow, blades of fluorescence and jalapeno taquitos from 7-Eleven. All this is the Lord's domain. These are the lines the Lord has drawn to cleave taquitos into the hot spin of being instead of nothing. These are the sidewalk cracks. These are the facts. In the video, the crushed cornerstone was the soft side of somebody's neck. This is the flinch we live in. Half a breath long, but looping with the bass in the cop's theme song. Anyone at 7-Eleven at 2 a.m. is looking for a way out or else a way in. Cruising the aisles for some crinkle wrap reason to say, thank heaven. Something marvelous in our eyes, bright and wide open. Cheesies and chips, energy drinks, phone plugs, earbuds, eggs, and big gulps the Lord has made. These are the rows and tower of itemized glare. And what else? Your patience with us, Lord, is villainous and tough as plexiglass. The cashier bows his skinny head and passes me a wax taquito. Good night, he says, not letting on whether he sees a bright side I just can't, or he merely hopes he might. Good night, he says again, setting me in the broad place of his smile. This is the gate, 
I ought to buy a lottery ticket for his winning cleft lip grin. I nod too. Thank you. He buzzes to unlock the unbroken glass, and outside, the night also endures. Um, this next poem is a sonnet, sort of, um, and it's called, Yeah, I Could Eat. Who put the ogle in Google? Obviously, World Vision doesn't care when I let flies crawl all over me. By its sheen, I guess, blue bottle. No, I'm not itchy, are you itchy? But we try and keep the screen closed while we're out here. Do pixels exist in the wild, like the water on the lawn chair you just sat in were those pixels? How come some lights are totally blockable and some lights are fire? A, hang a hangnail invades the panorama every time. It's like, wow, what a beautiful, wait, what's with my cuticle? Apparently, there's a space sickness astronauts get once they're back, and it's because they've had some nirvanic appreciation of the ultimate blue marble, then they land and just get saturated with traffic signals and cigarette butts on the beach. You know, when you zoom in too fast? Face it, a good reason is hard to search. For the 15th time today, YouTube tells me time has no meaning, thanks to McDonald's new all-day breakfast. Fine, not every flashing sign has to mean something, but actually, I just started seeing someone. And that was fun. I never read that poem. Uh, I mean, I have I've read it before, but uh, I don't usually read it out loud. But I thought it was a nice... I'm trying to read night poems. And so this last poem is because um, it's it's after midnight here. So I'm really on the go on a weeknight um, in honor of this week's lunar event. Um, I'm going to read Super Moon. Also, because I know Rebecca loves moon poems. Whatever, moon. I still think you're super. Even if you are waning a bit, not breaking any records like you were Saturday night, everybody stepped out with you hovering on the tip of their tongues, knowing the last time the earth and moon were so close, a war was over. It was 1948. The number one hit was You Call Everybody Darling by Al Trace and his orchestra. People danced and you, moon, tried to cut in with some bright jump of color and you weren't a sore loser. You got too caught in the groove, jive so resolute, the needle jumped, the acetate cracked, and nothing and nobody could be played again. Everyone smoked in those days and agreed it was quite a scene. You know what's super? 6.45 in the morning and I've already missed one bus and I'm racing around the corner to try and catch another, hopefully, and you, Moon, have a window seat on a train moving the opposite direction. Wait, no, you're not. You're still in the backyard, a few blocks over behind the house after house after house flying past me. You are so brightly eye level, I thought you were a pop-up billboard for cold medicine or drive-through banking or a crack of, or a gigantic baseball diamond floodlight for a crack of dawn pickup league. But no, you are the real moon chilling on a neighbor's fence, having overflowed their bird bath, your 873rd bath today, you seem super nearby, but we both must realize I'm not fast enough to really catch you. The morning always chaperones our little meetings. I can hear her purple slippers on the stair now. God damn, I am late for work. Enforcing big cold breaths under my parka at the bus stop, a couple with travel mugs, noodle their own morning routine when you, Moon, lean right into the middle of Massachusetts Avenue. For one minute, I only have eyes for you. All the other streetlights mean nothing next to you. My dumb mood, my, my dumb job, my pissy mood, busted zipper on my friggin' coat, it all shrivels while the seconds balloon. It does get boring. So when the bus rumbles, my eyes drop to it. And when the bus pulls up, I give you one last longish look, longer than my earlier, more struck look. My view stretched, no doubt, by the calisthenics of the fact we just can't change each other. 
So I punch another screeching fluorescent ride and you, dear moon, calling everybody darling, you ancient pervert, you knew by the light of your own scars, I couldn't stay even if I wanted to. That's it, thank you everyone. And thank you other poets for reading. I'm just having a great time. Thank you so much, Mary. I also am having a great time. This is a dream evening, sitting around, listening to poetry. I can't believe you're awake at midnight for this. You're so amazing. I would be, um, yeah, I would have napped and then woke up. I would have had a disco nap, but for poetry, a poetry nap. Um, yeah, we're all trying to see the moon. Uh, a lot of times the super moons happen on the West Coast when there's a rainstorm and you can't even appreciate it. It's very disappointing for all us moon lovers. All right, we have one incredible poet left. Get ready. And I do have the book here for you to see. Um, the poems in this collection are not afraid. They're not afraid to play around. They're not afraid to get to the point. Um, as Daniel Heath Justice says about this book on the blurb here, we are lucky indeed to have the restorative gift of Campbell's work in this ever more alienating world. Read it, share it, be transformed. Again, I could not agree more. These skilled blurbers are really getting to the heart of these uh, amazing books. Tenille K. Campbell is a Dene Métis author and photographer from English River First Nation in Treaty 10, Northern Saskatchewan. Her acclaimed poetry collection, Indian Love Poems from Signature Editions was shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Award. Campbell is the force behind Sweet Moon Photography, which specializes in capturing Indian joy in its many forms. She is also the co-creator and a blogger at T and Bannock, an online collective for Indigenous women photographers and artists to share their stories. Campbell completed her MFA in creative writing at the University of British Columbia and is working on a doctoral degree in Indigenous literature at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, please welcome to Neil. Uh, you're muted, Tanil. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so nice and gracious. I was thanking people. <laughs> okay, but so good to see everybody. Um, it's been a while since I've seen some of your faces. So uh, it's good for my heart. And I just got my first vaccine today. So I'm feeling like lightheaded but in the best of ways I feel so we're gonna do a little bit of reading bye sorry my kid is just like always trying to get on these things and from the newest collection which is titled Naidi Nezu which means good medicine <laughs> and, uh, uh, and these are all untitled because why not I want to taste your language as you whispered into my mouth. Let my tongue lick and suck your vowels and consonants. You make me want to slow dance under moonlight and snowflakes, hand tangled in your hair led down into heartbreak and hope. Make me your fry bread, make me your Indian corn soup, make me your candied salmon, make me your strawberry anything. Feast on me. Uh, and in this collection, um, I use a bit more Denny and Cree, slowly teaching myself things. And yeah, we're, we're going to try a little bit of Denny. Page 44. The first time I fell in love, I fell fearlessly. Heart tumbling, laughter echoing, fingers laced together on moon-filled nights. Your tongue teaching mine new ways to say Naganita. The first time I fell in love, I met your family. 
sitting around a kitchen table, ears warm, cheeks burning. They told me stories of you. They told me the beginning of you. The first time Neganada, Neganita Hesha, your fingers discovered me, waking desire, my first moans cresting in heavy shadows, legs spread, dripping wet, body learning new ways to say I love you. The first time I fell in love, I gave you my all, wild and reckless. Kondu Deneganita Persile. Holy, I sound real fluid, but I'm not. <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> um, let's do a sweet one. Let's do a sweet one. And then I'll do a not sweet one. I want to be tangled in moonlight, wrapped up in northern lights, guided home by the North Star, trailing down Churchill River, hand in hand with you. I want to be tracing your stories, constellations of ink and scars, hearing your memories echo in the dark between dusk and dawn. I want to be your roots ensnared in sandy soil lush with moss beside hidden waterfalls, soft rocks moved over by running water. I want to be part of your joy, the smile on your face when you hear my name, the blush in your cheeks when you think of last night. I want to be your home, your land, your memory. And then one last one, one of my favorite poems in the book for all my thick women out there. Thick indigenous women are spilt beads and tangled thread, worth the time to pick up and untangle. We are curves spilling stories against your lips, our thighs are soft mushke protecting good medicine. Our skin soft as tanned hide, caress us with care as you are touching our ancestors' wildest dreams. Thick indigenous women are the feast during a long winter. Canned raspberries, fresh bannock, warm butter leaking between your fingers. Come and eat. We hold joy in every round shoulder, laugh loudly, drawing all eyes. We squeeze against you and you hold us tight smiling at your blessings because thick indigenous women we are magic and if you aren't careful someone else will pick up spilled beans and untangle threads thank you thank you so much to neil um it's really great to see you um so now we have a few questions here from uh, the people watching at home. Yeah, like that was incredible. I hate that we're not in a room and everyone is just cheering uh, for that incredible reading, for all of these incredible readings, just they're all so professional. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll ask the question um, and then maybe we'll start in the opposite order. Uh, and if you don't wanna answer, that's okay. But uh, these are all questions that anyone can answer. So let's start with Tanil. And I'll, the first question he, here is, um, so would anyone like to talk about how long it takes to write a poem and do you revise a lot? So thinking about revision, thinking about your part of that process. So Tanil, if you wanna answer. Um, 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 um. I always feel kind of like, a, a, not, not a fraud, but like imposter syndrome, because I find for my style that I might go through like two or three, and then my ego is like, it's perfect. And then my editor is like, no, it's not. <laughs> so thankfully I have second readers who are like, mm -hmm, let's work this through. Because if it was up to me, it'd be like, no, no, it's great. So I guess like, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's the best answer. I I can't get over it. That was incredible. Uh, Mary, that was perfect. That's perfect. And I think that's so important too, that we recognize like that we have people that will work with us and editors and, you know, our, our peers. Hey, Mary. Hey, um, it is true. I'm so thankful for my second readers or third readers or fourth readers, but they're never 
I feel like I'm a lot harsher for the most part. Um, and it takes me an extremely long time to write a poem. But a lot of the poems in the book are five or six years old, or I started them five or six years ago um, and finished them much later than that. Um, but I also only go through a few drafts. So I don't revise, revise, revise. I write like two or three major drafts and it takes forever. And then I show them to Kevin at a Nancy year who are my readers. And um, they're like, oh, and then I revise a little more. It goes like that. But it's a slow, like, it's a slow process. Totally different from Tennille's. <laughs> Uh, Dallas, what about you? What's your uh, revision yeah. style? Yeah, um, so I think what I do is um, I also uh, uh, at times like to Neil sort of feel like a fraud in terms of, I don't know, I just, uh, I just, yeah, I write a bunch of stuff in my notes, you know, like in my, you know, in my phone and stuff like that. And I found that um, when I started to write a bit more with different like pronouns, like using the first person pronoun I and things like that, I, I, I became a little more intentional about how I would start to uh, approach, you know, a, a particular topic or things like that. Whereas before I thought my poems were much more sort of narrative in, in, in nature. Um, I generally just, um, yeah, uh, you know, write in my notes, revise later. That's really what it looks like. And um, some poems, I think I get on the first crack um, and then others, I think take, um, you know, weeks or days or whatever. Um, I, I think the thing is just what feels right to you, right? Like, um, so if you're writing poetry, just, and I can't emphasize how great editors are. I know we all kind of hate them in some weird way, <laughs> but I also think that they are, uh, they're great. That's what they're paid to do. And they're just, I've had so many great editors. Um, so, yeah. I, want, I could not agree more. Editors are so amazing. And you know what, if everyone could just keep their cameras on so we can see all of you um, in this last little bit, that would be awesome. Thank you. And uh, I feel like a fraud too. Like I just, I think it's really hard not to when you're in the dirty part of writing. Um, so Jen. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. I, everything I write takes about five to 10 drafts depending on what it is. And it, it uh, if it's uh, fiction or poetry or whatever, it's between five and nine drafts. The great thing about poetry is that they're a little shorter than a novel, which doesn't, so it doesn't take me quite as long because novels can take me like seven years and between, you, like, let's just say on average, a novel takes about five years. Um, a poem, like one singular poem, I could probably get it somewhat polished in about a month. But having said that, then it goes to an editor and my editor for The Shadowless is Paul Vermeer. She was really, really great. Um, and he said, thing, I remember one time I had a phone call with him and he said, what do you think about line breaks, Jen? And I said, you know, I don't think about line breaks. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I felt, like I felt so uh, like ridiculous. Um, but, it, you know, without, he, he took the poems to a whole other level that um, I couldn't bring it to. And, and as much as my second readers are really great uh, poets and really great editors also, um, I sometimes they'd tell me things I just wouldn't listen to it and I'd be like no it's fine um, but then it really wasn't so yeah that's how that looks for me <laughs> <laughs> these answers are all great though it just really goes to show there are so many different ways that we go about this and feel about it um, Terrence well um, first thoughts are generally bad thoughts um, I you know you're so in love with yourself half the time that uh, you can't believe it's it's quite infantile, really. Look what I look what I did. This is amazing. I must be great. I, you know, and you really you have to get over yourself very quickly. But at the same time, I think if you don't have doubts, if you're if you don't actually believe you're a fraud, there's something wrong with you, and you're probably writing terrible poetry. Um, uh, you just and every poem is a different different experience. I 
Some poems come quickly, some you have to uh, wrench from stone and it's painful and it, it goes on forever and you think it's terrible and then one day it, it, it's not. I'm, I, I, it's like, I don't think any short story, I don't think there's a formula for anything. If there were, I, can you get it? Can you send that to me? Because I, I would like a formula, that would be great, but mm, every poem's different. And I don't think you can make a pat statement about writing, just you got to sit down and do it. And um, I think COVID's been bad for that. COVID has just taken the wind right out of writing. It's like, what's the point? Uh, you know, it just, there doesn't seem to be any real motivation to do anything like that. So that's depressing. Um, yeah, let's move on to somebody else. Okay, Rebecca. Hi. Hey. Actually, I'm the one who kind of leaves things on a depressing note, so I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> um, no, I agree with a lot of what people are saying. It, for me, it's either the extreme of something just like while I'm in the shower just like happens and I have to like type it out on my phone with wet hands or um, some of the oldest uh, poems in my book are 12 years old, if not more. Um, a lot of this manuscript is kind of my older stuff and like some of the earliest poems I ever started writing and then I spent the next 10 years rewriting <laughs> over and over and over again uh, so it really depends like I think one of the newer poems in there only went through like two drafts if that um, yeah there's really no rule except let the poem do to you what it wants you to do <laughs> yeah that's the other thing like every poem is going to be different uh, okay, I've been, we have another question here. So part of it was a little bit covered because we talked a little bit about editing uh, in terms of that last question. Uh, can you describe your process of working with an editor on these poems? Does that process make you feel that aha moment with the pieces? Um, so maybe we could think more about the second part of this question, that moment of, uh, you know, realizing of completion. So we're moving from revision now to this you know, do you experience that, that final moment? I um, mean, if anyone, does anyone want to start? I can start assigning again. Uh, okay, I'm going to go with Jen because she's in the middle. Uh, me? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the thing for me with Paul and the way he edited my book was that he really made me consider blank space, which is not something that I do. I'm not, you know, I'm normally a, a well, not normally, but I've been writing prose for so long that I don't think about space at all, like blank space or like anything like that ever. <laughs> what do you mean your page is not just a block of text? I don't understand. Um, so he made me consider things like um, you know, moving things and assigning more space and giving, um, you know, visual breathing room uh, to the reader. And I think it completely changed so many of those poems. My poems tend to be very long lines. Um, the, the lines tend to be really like uh, jammed with words. <laughs> what You can take that quote to the bank. Jen Sukbong Lee says her books are jammed with words. That's a selling point. I don't know why my publicist hasn't used that yet. Um, and, you know, he made me break those up, which I thought was, I know it sounds simple, but it was really one of those moments that made my brain go, yes, yes, I clicked, everything clicked in and I thought this book makes so much more sense now. Amazing. Okay, I'm just going to go down the line now. Uh, Dallas. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll say a few things, I guess. Um, so I n normally write sort of like critical articles and stuff as, you know, uh, you're, you, you have to do that at universities and, 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 and things like that. And so the one thing, but then when you get your edits back, you're just like immediately hostile. <laughs> you're like, oh, fuck you, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <laughs> um, but with, uh, so, I, so I think the clearest example of this that I can give is in terms of editing is that um, instead of the book of poetry that I write, uh, that I just wrote that was, um, I had great editors on and uh, they were just fantastic and made me, as Jen was just saying, think about space differently, think about how words are arranged, like arranged on the page and, and all of these things. Uh, I wrote a children's book one time and I had no idea about the, uh, about the genre 
And then I remember I got the edits back from like a, an editor who does children's poetry or sorry, not children's poetry, children's uh, books. And um, they were like, okay, this should be in all caps because somebody's yelling here. This should be, you know, all of the, like all of these things that I never would have thought of like ever. When I turned in my manuscript, it was like a, it was a word doc that was just like, child goes here. There's a bear here, <laughs> you know, things like that. <laughs> and so just engaging with editors and then being like, well, we know the genre and we know how, you know, this would appeal to particular audiences. And I don't mean that in a way that's like palatable and you're just giving like, you know, uh, pablum or whatever to people, but, but rather you're making the book more interesting. Yeah, I don't know. There's just something about, um, I've encountered various editors now and uh, they've really given good advice and been very great. And the worst of them are academic. Uh, 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 so fuck all y'all academic uh, editors, but okay. That was my response. Um, Honestly, loved it. Love to hear it. Uh, yes, Terrence, please. It's, it's really humbling when somebody takes your poems or your stories even more seriously than you do and reads them closely and um, is paying attention. It, it's, it's quite a humbling experience because, you know, uh, we used to say that uh, if you really wanted to edit your poem, that you were handing it to PK Page. And as, as soon as you imagine that you're handing your poem to PK Page, you immediately take it back and go, no, I'll do a little more work on it before I actually bother you with this because if she's going to spend that amount of time, you want it to be really good. There's a real, um, you know, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a commitment to, to edit a poem. And I'm lucky to have uh, editors. Um, Patricia is the best editor. Uh, and then I also have a great group that uh, my poems go through. And it, yeah, a first reader is worth his or her weight in gold. Um, it just, it's amazing what can happen. And it's a little bit like smoking cannabis because you never saw the poem that way before. It's like, whoa, that's pretty cool. Uh, and it, it just becomes a, a different experience. And you're so glad to have stepped to another perspective to see how that line resonated when you hadn't even intended that inflection in the line. I think anybody who writes drama and you put lines of dialogue on the page and then you actually go and hear those lines read by some fledgling, you see how the actors or the director takes that line and you're, you're just completely blown away that that line can be read radically differently from how you originally intended it. And I, I think it's a, just a great, great growing process. We're learning so much, cannabis, fuck academic editors. Jen's books are full of words. Like so much is happening. My brain is getting full. It's feeling amazing. Um, Tenille? Oh no. I know, I'm good. <laughs> oh, you, you're very good. <laughs> um, editors, um, I agree with Dallas. Fuck academic editors, um, period. Um, I think for me, the favorite and worst part of editing was um, not so much with this first this book, but with my first book, Indian Love Poems. I had structured the poems very deliberately on a speaking pattern of women who English was a badly learned second language. And this was deliberate. And my first editor, the first round, he looked at it, he, he fixed it. <laughs> and I was like, burn yeah. in hell. And <laughs> Yeah, and I was just like, no, I was just like, we yeah. need to have a discussion. And um, being able to kind of advocate for myself and like the way I wanted this to sound was really important. And once he got it, he got it. Like communication was key. And with the second one, um, like I said, I was like, this is perfect. And editors were like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But by the time we went through like that final read through and they were good, but um, there's two poems in here that I have One's in full Dene and one's in full Cree. I don't speak either language fluently at all. And, um, but I had them transcribed by obviously speakers. And um, 
one of the mis- one of the mistakes is in one of the Cree poems, which nobody will know if they don't speak Cree. Nobody will know. But my Cree speaker friend was just like, "Don't at me, Dallas. Don't at me. <laughs> don't look for it either." Oh. <laughs> but she like read it, and then she just gave me like this look, and I'm like, "What did I do?" <laughs> So I think it was like the amount of like going back and what's lost in translation and what's missed in translation and, you know, can't do non-speakers. Should we write poetry in other people's languages? I don't know. There, I had a lot of soul searching going on with these two simple poems. Yeah. And the other thing is too, guess what? You know what? Readers might not know. Every book's got... I would guarantee at least one typo, problem, mistake. Like there's no way to avoid it. You do your best and it's always in there. You can't, it's unavoidable. We are all imperfect and gorgeous and wonderful, but, but yeah, it happens. Uh, Rebecca, some, some quick last words. We're going to start to wrap up here, but, and sure. then Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been working as an editor with lit magazines for about 11 years I spent the day writing a job application and trying to figure out the number um but there's so much trust involved in that process whether you're the writer or the editor like trusting someone with your work or being trusted with that work you have to invest so much in that and like Tanil said sometimes it doesn't work and people totally uh take an editing stance that disrespects the work um fuck academic editors is the line um but also like when you find a fit where someone is not imposing their style on you but asking you the right questions to kind of get you um thinking in the direction that you want to go in and kind of like focusing that energy that's kind of a magical relationship when you're able to establish that and it's so so wonderful to like have someone take the time with your work and see something brilliant that you didn't know you were even doing and then suddenly you can start doing that on purpose (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah there's so much trust involved in that and I think that like the level of respect you have to have for each other is super important yeah for someone to edit the book that you wrote not the book that they want you to have written like for them to be on board to advocate for for the for the project that is there um is key no that's awesome and mary you're gonna have the final word wow no press <laughs> yeah uh, just kidding i'm gonna say the last word okay it's gonna okay, be okay. goodbye okay. forever no please continue oh. <laughs> um no i just want to echo um especially what terrence and rebecca were saying about like that that level of respect and that and actually like how magical it can be to work with an editor for the most part, I've had really good experiences. And there is, I think more than that aha moment when you finished a poem and you're talking to the editor and the editor's like, yeah, it's good. And you're like, yeah, it's good. You like flip to that, you like scroll down. Um, when you're working and they've given you notes, you're like, wow, like you care about something as much as I do. Uh, that moment is so, uh special and I think like trust yes and also just like so much respect for I I feel like I have so much respect for my editors and I don't care what they think um although I have I'm not afraid to be like no you're you're wrong about that one and luckily my um most of the people that I work with have been like yeah okay maybe I am maybe I am um so that's been good Anyways, final word, Dina. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Thanks for everyone for sticking around. We're a little bit over time, but uh, I really want to thank all these readers again. Incredible stuff. Rebecca, Terrence, Mary, Dallas, Jen, Tennille. um, You're all wonderful. I love your work. It was a real pleasure to be here and to get to introduce you. What a friggin' joy. Um, So... Thanks to the BPL and uh, Leslie and the whole Vancouver Writers Fest team for putting this together. I hope everyone keeps reading poetry, even though it's not going to be poetry.
three month poetry is fucking for all time and you don't only need to read it in April. So don't forget that. It's really important that you do not forget that. Um, and everybody, I'm, I'm out of here. So thank you so much. Thank Have you. a wonderful thank evening. It was a pleasure you. meeting you all, really. Lovely. It was a delight to have you all here tonight to share your shimmering and provocative works. And uh, I know that poetry has been something that's been getting me through this past year, um, sometimes because the pieces are short enough that I can read them over and over several times while my brain turns on and then captures what it's trying to say to me, unlike a novel that has been so hard to get through this year. So poetry, poetry has been really... <laughs> really special. And all of these books, uh, these are available in your favorite independent booksellers right across Canada. So please do get out there and pick up a copy or six of these and, um, and share them around because they are gifts to be shared. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I hope you will all come visit us on a real stage where we can um, give you back some of the energy from our audience that I know you're missing here on these screens tonight but please feel it feel the energy of the audience we loved having you here and uh, wish you a very happy evening good night night